Um, I'm Dr. Lara Susan Golasofi. I'm the Founder, Executive Director, and Advocacy Director at the Center for Migration, Gender, and Justice. The Center for Migration, Gender, and Justice, or CMGJ abbreviated, is a nonprofit NGO that addresses human rights at the intersection of migration and gender through research, advocacy, and education. We are women, migrant, and youth-led, and our work is locally based and globally engaged. And we launched a CMGJ out of the belief that gender justice goes beyond borders, and that that necessitates shared agency representation and accountability in protecting human rights for all. So to achieve this, we've made it our mission to shrink spaces between migrant communities and governing bodies, and our research advocacy and education contribute to this vision and mission. Yeah, so in our research, broadly, we identified the specific needs and challenges of women, girl, LGBTQI+, and gender diverse migrants, and develop recommendations for stakeholders. In our advocacy efforts, we, as mentioned, our mission being we try to shrink spaces between migrant communities and governing bodies through organizing and campaigning. And then in our education work, we bring together migrant communities, non-state actors and state actors by facilitating capacity building and dialogue. So there are three main projects that are worth highlighting just to demonstrate the specific themes that we work on. Um, so they include for one, the Gender Migration Index or GMI, which we developed. Um, the GMI is a policy guidance tool that centers lived experiences of women, girl, LGBTQI plus and gender diverse migrants by strengthening civil society engagement and international review processes. And so the index is based on an indicator system that ensures gender responsiveness and migrant inclusion in benchmarking, particularly in regards to monitoring and evaluation. A second project that demonstrates our work is the Migrant Youth Leadership Program or MYLP, uh, which trains youth, uh, migrant youth um, for collective action at the intersection of migration and gender. And so the program consists of three components an education section, which includes an online course on migration and gender, then followed by a research section, which includes a workshop series on methods and approaches in studying migration and gender, and then kind of Cumulating in an advocacy section, which includes the main output of the Migrant Youth Leadership Program, namely the curation of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence campaign. And then thirdly, um, our new spotlight project on migration, peace and security. And uh, this project seeks to monitor regional refugee and migrant response plan in regards to gender responsiveness with a focus on gender-based violence and to provide recommendations to stakeholders um, in regards to this. Yeah, so um, as noted, our work is locally based and globally engaged, so meaning that our focus on the intersection between migration and gender in the context of Germany constitu constitutes one aspect of our broader strategic plan. And so to just end what is noteworthy um, to answer the question is that I participated in the UN high level political forum review on Germany in 2021 as a civil society delegate. And we, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice published a civil society report that speaks to how structural racism manifests in Germany. The report is titled Migration, Gender and Labor, the Case of Germany, and it focuses on refugee women's labor market participation and identifies four key challenges that refugee women face to access and to succeed in the German labor market. And these include language proficiency, professional and educational opportunities and sociocultural dynamics, as well as self-determination. And so the report was based on data collection in the form of observations as very, at various programs that were designed for women. And so when talking about manifestations of structural racism, the challenge of self-determination is notable, especially for Muslim refugee women wearing a headscarf. Um, discrimination because of the headscarf was discussed throughout our observations. 
And so given the legal institutional framework that allows for permissible difference in treatment based on occupational requirements, as is enshrined in the 2006 General Act on Equal Treatment, uh, Muslim refugee women often find themselves in the dilemma of having to choose between their self-determination, religion, and employment. And this dilemma was evidenced in initial experiences of the refugee women in the German labor market, as some participants reported being questioned about their headscarf and job interviews, as well as at the workplace, often resulting in rejections of job applications and experiences of discrimination at work. And for this question, I would like to speak here as a German-Iranian woman uh, who has experienced discrimination, particularly as youth in the education system, um, where I would say issues of racism in Germany are informed by prevailing identity narratives of what it means to be German or European for that matter. And these identity narratives then manifest in structural and institutional forms. Um, so it is, for instance, through distinctions that are made between Germans with a migration background, such as myself, and those without that this kind of eternal guest status or the rendering of being a forever other are firmly established in the ways that Germanness, and again, by extension, Europeanness is negotiated. This is also exhibited, for instance, through associations regarding ethnicity and nationality, on the basis of one's names, as again is the case for me. So all this to say that uh, to me, it's prevailing identity narratives of Germanness and Europeanness that are configured through structural and institutional forms of racism, and that in order to address this, we must just not forget the underlying premises thereof. Yeah, so we launched the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice in March 2020, right when the COVID-19 pandemic began. We planned for this launch event during the UN Commission on the Status of Women to share our vision of gender justice beyond borders and our mission of shrinking spaces between migrant communities and governing bodies with the world. Um, unfortunately, we had to reroute these plans and given the situation, we took 2020 is kind of the soft launch year. Um, as advocacy moved online, we tried to leverage spaces to the best of our abilities and are um, grateful for our partners um, that have supported us from the get-go. And so while we've been able to grow our reach and partnerships, it is now through in-person events that we are seeing a significant increase in the interest of our work, particularly in spaces that would otherwise have been closed to civil society, to a civil society organization such as ours, that is women, migrant, and youth-led. So at this point, it is really great to see how our work, our vision, and our mission resonate with different stakeholders. And we're actually quite overwhelmed by the interest and opportunities that are coming our way, which leads me to the main challenge that we're currently facing, and that is one that is common um, and of which we understand our positionality therein. So it's funding. Um, at this moment, we operate on a volunteer basis with project-specific funds for some of our work. So we're really hoping to receive some core strategic and organizational funding to truly leverage our expertise and the possibilities that we see as part of the already immense contributions that we've, we've already made. It's really difficult, I would say, to single out one main achievement because, again, every day our mailbox is filled with another opportunity extended our way. This said, um, it is not one project, one publication, or one campaign that can capture our achievements. I would say it is our team, the team that makes it happen. Um, being women, migrant, and youth-led really makes us unique in many ways, not least in the community that we have built for each other. So, in the love and care that we have for another um, and in the common passion and drive that makes us move forward every day. Our team meetings are more than just checking off agenda items. They offer a time for us to be together, to share and to exchange where we are at in life and where we hope to be. And I've honestly never seen a space that gives me so much strength and believe in gender justice beyond borders and our team. So, it's our hearts and minds that comprise our main achievement.
patience. <laughs> patience is the first word that comes to my mind. Um, structural change takes time. Um, it is easy, I would say, to fall for band-aid fixes, for quick fixes, but actual structural change takes time. And so patience really is a virtue when it comes to advocacy work. And this is something that I've learned over the years. And now I find myself thinking more strategically, more sustainably of what we seek to do and how we achieve it. So just for an example, um, our mission of shrinking spaces between migrant communities and governing bodies is, is a tall order. Um, and there are various ways to achieve this, or at least to work towards this mission. And so some ways might be set within a time frame with immediate results, such as our migrant youth leadership program that is six months with a concrete end kind of goal with the curation of the 16 days campaign against gender-based violence. Um, some other ways might require longevity with results not seen over the years, such as our gender migration index. But uh, what matters is, is, is that impact. Allies are, are certainly important. Um, uh, Multi-stakeholder approaches are needed and, and the kind of work that we do, right, in addressing intersectional uh, discrimination and, and for us the intersection particularly of migration and gender and so different stakeholders hold different powers um, that can collectively lead us to create change and to embrace our vision of gender justice beyond borders um, this said um, allyship comes with power configurations and as a civil society organization, I think it's always important to remember that po the power that we also hold within partnerships and collaborations. Um, from my experience, I would say that civil society in Germany is still very much seen as kind of the third or alternative sector in politics. And with that come rather neglecting views of what organizations can actually achieve. And again, the power that comes with it, how they operate within the political arena. And so interactions with civil society um, often take the form of tokenization or, or checking of boxes and they remain within um, consultation spaces, for instance, rather than along the entire policy change cycle, which is truly important. right? Um, also, I would like to note that civil society is often regarded as the extension of the state, as organizations provide the necessary services and resources to migrant communities due to proximity, right? But this assigned positionality is restrictive to the potential of civil society, particularly when it comes to addressing structural racism. Big question. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, first of all, to remember that we are all part of civil society and that it's important to amplify the work done by civil society. And this can take um, various forms. It can be involvement in organizations, donations to organizations, but also um, not, to, not to forget social media and that space alike or share amplifying in, in whatever way might, might be possible, right? Um, we all hold our power um, and so leveraging that and understanding it is important. And so to collectively, it, collectively we have power as civil society. So, so let's use it. <laughs>